iCloud. Let's go to the Hey, Richard, welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. Hey, Elizabeth, thanks for having me. So excited to be talking with you today. So here's a little fun fact about me. I, I know I messaged you. I said this is a little nerve wracking because I um, to interview a journalist is, is something else. But I got to tell you that I have a broadcast journalism background. I studied broadcast journalism in the early 90s at Penn State. And as I was thinking about it, it gave me a little bit of anxiety because I it was stressful to reserve the equipment and pull out those headlines from the state college borough council and planning commission meetings yeah no it's uh you knew it was work right serious work it's work yes it's very it's um I'm, i always wonder what it's like now to go to school and study that so um i'm sure technology has made things a little bit easier it has i mean now it is the, the stuff is so light and portable um and now in the last two years a lot of our reporting has even become just out of our phones um, and our homes, as you've seen. So mm -hmm. things have really, I mean, they changed already. And then the last two years, what's acceptable has absolutely made it easier for us to report anywhere. I love that. Well, it's, and it's easier to, to extract the stories and find the, the good nuggets. I, um, we always kick off the show with just on a positive note. I like to to get things rolling. So I had created this super fancy jar um, called the Happy Healthy Caregiver Jar. Quotes and and little mantras have always meant a lot to me. And so when we transitioned care from me to my sister, I just felt like I was giving her this huge boulder mm -hmm. and I wanted to um, have a little bit of a nugget in her ear just to make sure she didn't lose herself in this process of caring for my mom. Great idea. So, would love to get your thoughts on this, Richard. It says the best time to start working out and eating right was yesterday. The next best option is today. And that's by someone named Jeremy Scott. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I've been thinking that more and more. I'm now in my, I guess, sixth or seventh year of caregiving. And the last year and a half, I stopped working out maybe a year ago and stopped eating well and so that hits home because i've been thinking about it this last well i shouldn't say thinking about it. i started to do something about it this past week got my annual checkup that i haven't gotten in five years uh so that's a start right you have to have to have a, base, a baseline uh getting all the you know all, all, all of the system getting checked out and um Eating well, I've realized does matter hugely. And so last night I decided, okay, I'm having fish. It's good for the heart. Us guys, we got to worry about that stuff. You know how it is. Um, so yeah, I think it's super important. And uh, I know that I have forgotten about it, uh, at least in the last year, year and a half. My mother has absolutely forgotten about it in her caregiving for my father. And it, um, you know, she would, she loves 7-Eleven. And I don't work for them, by the way. What's that 7-Eleven that I need to know about? She loves her hot, just hot dogs. <laughs> she loves hot dogs. And so, I mean, she grew up in Southern California. That's a big diner town. She loves her diner. She loves her hot dogs and cheeseburgers. And so, you know, she would escape once in a while when there was a part-time caregiver there. She'd just go for a drive, get a hot dog and a Coca-Cola and just go to the beach. Uh, and just eat it and then come home and return to her 24 seven job. Yeah. But, well, at yeah. least she got some kind of break in 7-Eleven being a big partner that who knows, like maybe I should reach out to have them sponsor. That's funny. I wonder <laughs> if she knows how long they've been on the conveyor belt. There used to be a yes. radio show about um, that was what they used to call Unimart. It was what it was in Pennsylvania and asked them how long they've been on the conveyor belt. <laughs> funny. Too funny. Well, I think that you um, I applaud you for getting your health and prioritizing your wellness visits. And I um, I think a lot of times caregivers have this all or nothing mentality, but it can be just one little baby step in front of the other. And I do notice a difference that when I eat and differently, how that affects me, but it's it's something that we all just, we can, it's a journey, right? It's, We're all work in so progress. True. I notice even more now what I eat counts. I mean, I guess before when we started, before we started our caregiving journey, Elizabeth is that um, we took for granted 
the ability to eat these things or live this way or, or take care of our health this way. And um, now I'm absolutely moving into the space of understanding mind health. And mm. sometimes we forget about that and we don't attach those words. You know this because even in the caregiver space, saying you're a caregiver is a big leap. Don't tell me what I am. I know what I am. I do it. Don't give me a label. It's just what I want to do. Um, and then attaching that to mental health is even a bigger leap. But these are all stretches for both us as caregivers, as well as those that we care for. Exactly. I think for me, when I first got into this happy, healthy caregiver journey seven years ago, the physical self-care was so apparent in my life about um, because I had seen three examples of what happens when you don't take care, when you don't prioritize your health and happiness, my mother in law with lung cancer and my parents with chronic health conditions. So physical self care was important, but as throughout the seven years I've realized that self care is really, really complex, frankly, and there is mental and emotional self care and, and professional self care and practical yeah. and social and mm -hmm. financial like it all is a puzzle that goes together and so hopefully you know, happy, healthy caregiver and people like yourself are presenting different ideas for people to try on and see what works for them. Well, you know, the, the very title of what you're doing, happy and healthy, like that is, you know, when I first saw the, the titling of what you're doing with the podcast, I was like, this is exactly what not only is needed, but sometimes forgotten that you can have that as a caregiver. And it doesn't have to be all one type, which is, you know, the suffering caregiver or the overworked. We, we are that, you know, that uh, personally, but we can have joy despite the difficulty and happy, healthy caregiver. I mean, I just love the, the tone, what it means, because gosh, I know 52,999,000 other folks that need to hear that other than me today. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a mindset uh, for sure. It's a lot of reframing, a lot of just trying to see what works to both energize and make you feel at peace. So we'll share a little bit, Richard, more about your caregiving journey. I know you teased us a little bit, but um, if you could elaborate on it a little bit. It was something that um, was both sudden, but not. It was, um, I guess, seven years ago or eight now. The years melt, as you know, uh, <laughs> my father started to forget things. He never was a guy that could remember things anyway. Uh, but his sister and he came from a brood of 13 kids. One of his so you knew they were close and they grew up poor. So they were super close. His youngest sister and my father's, I think, number eight comes up and, to me at our annual Christmas gathering which is like a hundred Louis, like we're just all gathering. I'm always talking to my mom and dad, who's the new cousin, what's their name? You know, <laughs> I don't know what, you gotta tell me uh, that many, right? But we, we, we did always a, a Christmas gathering and a Thanksgiving uh, and a, a, a Lunar New Year gathering. So these were really important. My dad was a family guy. And when his youngest sister came up to me during that annual gathering and said, your father can't remember his siblings' names. Mm. And she took me outside uh, on, it was a sunny day and that's, we have sunny days, uh, sunny Christmas days in California. <laughs> and so we went outside, it was a sunny day. And she said, I said, okay, I'll get him to go in to see the neurologist. And uh, so I talked to my family, my mom and my siblings and my dad said, okay, I'll go in. And he went in and they said, yeah, early potential. And then he went back again and they said, yes, now you're, you're at early stages of what we, we do things Alzheimer's. Um, and I had to decide, I knew it, it wasn't earth shaking, but it was earth shaking. I decided whether I want to continue working in New York where I'm sitting right now. Mm -hmm. And this is where I have my job uh, as a journalist and news anchor. And then my, my dad's in California. And so I went and talked to my boss, Elizabeth, and I, I thought it was potentially saying goodbye to something that I had really fought for for so long. And, but I, it was, I was open to having that discussion. I didn't want it to happen, but I was open in my brain, in my heart. So, okay, that's a possibility. She turns around and she says to me, and I, and she's one of those consummate journalists. She's the big boss of all of daytime programming. 
but she's a consummate journalist I, and she she just says it the way it is mm -hmm. there's no you know and i like that always about her because she had such a great editorial mind instead she turns to me and goes richard you know i don't you don't know this but i'm also the primary caregiver for my mother in florida and first of all she never shared stuff like that like i said she was a great editorial um, lead and manager and decision maker that wasn't the part that i knew about her and then she says let's figure out something where you can still stay with us and you can still care for your father and i was just like wait okay, <laughs> did that happen? how did this happen you, you don't have news anchors on-air people that work less than seven days a week. Uh, I, I say that because we're always on call. Mm -hmm. And I knew that she had sent me around the country and the world to do all these stories for, for years. And now all of a sudden she's saying it, well, let's see how we can make it work. And so now for six years, I've been working um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then flying home when my father was in the rough patches for about three, four years, I would fly back three times a, a month uh, now yeah. my mother, who's not well, I fly back two times a month. It's a lot. Well, I think when you say, how did this happen? I think your boss having caregiving experience is amazing. And I talk to a lot of caregiving clients all the time and, and they're like, I wish I could help care for my loved one more and not, you know, not work my full time job. And why not? You know, if you yes. built you built trust with your employer, and I think that is something that we you know when we're working with caregivers. I mean, we are masters of our time management, right? Because we got to work. We're we're working, and when we're not working, we've got to be focused on other things. And there are some flexible options, you know, of part time work like you're doing, or job sharing was something. You know, I worked at Turner Broadcasting. I job shared with another mom when my kids were young. And oh, that's awesome. That's a great Yeah, we, we put great a proposal with together and we overlapped on Wednesdays and, and we were both, you know, high performers. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna, you can, you can get, I'm not endorsing any company here, by the way, my current boss is at, uh, you know, Comcast, NBC Universal, but Turner was creative that way. I have to say, because I'm a former Turner employee. Yes, too, as you they know. were they were maybe bleeding edge a little bit, like that very yeah. very willing, and that was back, you know, again in the in the oh. '90s. Um, it just something's something's got to be different for me, and that that worked for a while, and then you know we 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 tried, and they were doing a 980 program, nine days, eighty hours was something that I um, enjoyed there so yes well we we have lots of lots in common i love that you your workplace was receptive to it and i just yes, encourage yes. people who want things to be differently to just have the conversation be vulnerable maybe don't share too much but you know definitely uh they're, they're we're creative people and we can come up with a solution that's going to be a win-win like the one that you've been living out yeah I'm, I'm so with you on this when it comes to your profession and you uh enter into this Oh my gosh, I, I want to do something for my loved one. Um, and, and you know, the studies show uh, we have absenteeism, we have presenteeism. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out what the right way is to bring it up. You know, I, look, I don't have any children. I'm not a woman, but I, I often bring up the similarities of if I was pregnant and walking into the office saying I'm pregnant to my team, or my supervisor, because we have to plan ahead, because I want to take uh, leave. That's what caregivers are going through, if they're even thinking about talking to their bosses that, okay, immediately now I have this label of, can I get the stuff done that they want done? And that's one of the parallels I bring in. And I can get it, I totally get it. Because, you know, immediately once you say I'm a caregiver, I have to take care of somebody and I don't know what's going to happen and I may have to leave and I'll call. I'll let you know, of course, when I can't come in. Da, 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 da. But I think we're now in a space where organizations want us to live. And the last two years have really changed this kind of conversation. That is one of the, the, the great outcomes of something that was so horrible. But I, I really, I, you know, caregiving ERGs, if you're at work, start one yes i one. i am a, a fan of them i was you know i i used to work 
I don't think you work for Aaron's, but I used to work for Aaron's Rent to Own. We don't have that in common, but I we I led a women's um, group at there, and we started you know giving a voice to those topics, uh, flexibility and caregiving. And so I do encourage companies and to have EBRGs, and if you have one, invite me to come speak because I would love to share about some of the uh, topics that we have. Well, uh, all right, consider yourself when I get this thing off the ground. So right before COVID started, I was in the beginnings of creating a sub ERG because our company is so gargantuan, which we're used to working in, we don't want to create too many. So we created a sub ERG that's going to be for caregivers. Um, and then this thing happened. And the, 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 the person that leads all the ERG BRGs said yes. And so when we get back into the building, we start this thing up. Um, yes, you're invited. I would love to help shape what that looks like because, um, and I just wrote a, a blog post that I'll share in the show notes that that explains why employers should do this. It's a it's a win win for everybody. It is absolutely. What what's your role, Richard, on the Louis Care team? What are some of your responsibilities that you have? You know, it's to it's changes, and the, this is the one thing we've learned in this latest caregiving round with my mother is that we all need time away and before we were all running and gunning for my father so we all were like there um most of us were there was one sibling who was not at all ready even though my father's affliction was much much more apparent and re uh, required more hospitalization um so what we learned in the now with my mother is that we have a mixture of when we're primary or secondary. I think if that's an easier way to uh, mm -hmm. describe it, or in this case, scheduler of caregivers for my mother, because she needs 24 seven um, help now or supervision physically. So uh, sometimes it's me scheduling. Sometimes it's one, another brother scheduling. What about finances? It's this brother, or this or, or my sister who handles uh, all the medical appointments and we all come and go and we accept, I think what we may not have been able to accept before that we all are hitting limits. And that is, I think with the, with the role discussion is a super important acceptance and it, it takes time. So I get it. Like it took us five, six years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's some things that are worse now in terms of communication between us. There's some things that are better. And it just has kept on changing. So my role has varied, you know, because I'm traveling back and forth. Sometimes it will be the person that will, you know, the, how do I put it, that, that will take her out for entertainment, like entertainment, I go home, mom, let's go have a meal. Uh, let's go to the beach. So we all have different roles. I mean, if you want to make it as a business role, you know, the, the, the CFO, you know, that has not been me, but I am the person that is going to look, be part of this, the CFO team. I'm not going to lead on that, but I, there's a lot of things that I can offer up on that when it comes to, um, the COO, uh, yeah, I'll take on that role of making sure all the trains operate, but then my sister will hop in to make sure all the trains operate, uh, so we, we we switch back and forth on the chief of operations. So there, there's different sort of roles that we've been taking taken on. Yeah, well, I appreciate that you you know you share how you're evolving and that it doesn't always look the same. And I know we've had it. I'm one of six kids, and I have an older brother with a developmental disability. I have one brother that's not so much help as you say, maybe not ready to accept it. You know, or or. Yeah. Um, and then we all have different strengths and different relationships with our parents and, and yes. what a time is a lot. So did you say what your mom's diagnosis was? It's orthostasis, which causes her, that? her blood pressure will go up and down randomly and to a point where she will faint. So she could be walking along mm. and then all of a sudden her blood pressure will drop to 90 over 60 and she faints, falls to the ground. Wow. And, so, and as we know, when we age, a fall is not like when you're young and you can just hop up. Yes. And what, what caused it was her, and initially, I would say her caregiving for my father, which was so intense during these difficult periods I was describing, and we were all learning as a family how to create the right team and get mm -hmm. the right skills in place. 
she was the 24 seven primary caregiver that never complained. And, um, when we, we find, when she finally said, okay, cause we said, mom, you know, this is now reaching a point where I don't think, you know, you can handle this alone. I don't think having a full-time caregiver in the house will even allow you to live, um, peacefully, not peace was not right, but live health, healthily would be uh -huh. the word because she would, even when we had caregivers there, she would want to still be managing everything. So it didn't help in other words, but as soon as she agreed that, okay, maybe dad needs to be in a care home because we just can't keep up even with a full-time caregiver that, and she said, yeah, I think so. When she said, yeah, I think so. And that's the way she said it, it wasn't like a gung ho. It was like, um, resignation of that. That would be best. Then I knew it was time because she yeah. was basically saying, I can't do any more. I'm 86 years old. I'm, I look like I'm 70, but I've aged so much. She didn't say this. I'm just speaking in her voice. <laughs> and, and then as soon as he moved into the care home is when I saw how much she had given because the, the smartest, an IQ and EQ in our family, all of a sudden was having trouble remembering things, not being able to process things that she's the smartest person in our, in our home. Yeah. And I knew that she'd been operating on adrenaline for two years. And once the adrenaline went away, you could see all the bruises. And then when COVID hit after that, and she had to stay at home with no interaction, she's a quiet social person. Mm -hmm. she's like when you meet her, Elizabeth, she's not going to be like, Hey, how you doing? She'll be like, hi, Elizabeth. Good to see you. How are you? And then she'll just talk and talk and talk and talk and but when she didn't have that and was stuck at home by herself, because I'm in New York and my brothers don't live with her, you know, that was the, the last, that was a straw that broke the camel's back for her. And that's how she got to orthostasis. Wow. So the caregiving, um, there is just something about the providing the social interaction that you know so well, that has be, even become more valuable uh than ever because we have been removed from that and i it just really hurts me all of the the folks in the age group of my mother or in the condition of my mother that we they can't get it back you and i can get it back and they can't get it back they were stuck at home and so that's a long answer to your question. No, it's hard. It's hard to be a part of it. And I think, you know, there are you, you know, mitigating risks of of health versus a mental and emotional health. And so for every family and every person, I think it looks it looks different. Well, you have two projects that I want to talk about. One is that your book that I um for those who are watching, it's enough about me. Uh, enough about me, the unexpected power of selflessness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand selflessness didn't come easy to you. You know, why was that that case? And why did you write this book? It was really inspired by caregiving. I mean, who would ever write a book about selflessness? Um, it's an anti self self help book. I um, love it. And, yeah. And it was because I love self help books. But you know, the, the trend started to be these books that were about me, 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 I'm a wonderful person starts with me, it's always me first, it's all, you know, how do I perfect the unit of one. And that's not what I think the idea of becoming a better person necessarily began as I think it began as we do need to understand ourselves, we do need to accept ourselves. Um, and so enough about me is basically the opposite of that. And it's saying you can practically get better personally by thinking and caring about others. And, and so the, the caregiving journey is what even brought me to ever think I could write such a book above my pay grade. This thing is I'm not a, a selfless person. Uh, so I'm not the expert on it, but what I am is a journalist. And so I, I approached it as a journalist writing a, a self-help book that therefore need to be very practical and, f and backed up by research. So mm -hmm. there's a, a scientist that came onto the team. There's a researcher that came onto the team. Uh, there was also two comedians uh, that had to help me kind of understand the, the, the funnier parts of my stories and the funnier part of what I, I want to be. 
because <laughs> I knew I couldn't write. I'm not a comedic writer. So they, all these coaches were in here. There's a, two poets um, as well. So there's poems in the back of the book. Yeah, and there's all, there's all these charts in there. There's a, there's a couple of um, self-evaluation tools in there where you can score how selfless you are. You can also score how much you may give too much. And that was a really important part. We started by talking about that, Elizabeth. Is yeah, that's important. I wanted to hit, hit on that because, you know, we talk about self-care on this and a lot of times caregivers can't get there. You know, they just can't reframe how, how they should take care of themselves when they take care of others. So is self-care selfish? No, no, you know the answer, um, especially in the caregiving context. Um, we feel guilty sometimes. Um, yesterday um we had an issue with the uh the, the schedule where the caregiver was now going to arrive two hours late and or a gap she wasn't late it was it was our fault on the schedule and my sister asks me richard can you cover remotely through our our cloud uh camera system because mm. and so since we're all in different places we will we will caregive remotely sometimes. We'll get on the phone and then we'll watch and we'll talk to my mother. And I said, I can't, uh, I'm supposed to uh, meet up for a dinner. And I felt badly, but I knew that I needed to go have that dinner. And I accept too when she or any other of my siblings say, I can't do it because we all have to do these things. That's the the very common story that you, you know and you've told about feeling guilty about self-care and self-care is being human um and and so is it selfish it is but is it bad selfish no it's the good good stuff and that's why when we go through in the book and talk about unmitigated selflessness you know basically unstoppable giving you know that's just not good your it's the studies we show not that you need them show the reduction in in lifespan the reduction in health the reduction in brain health the reduction in physical health all of these things that we need to watch so yeah very possible now that's why you know i, I put that in there because i the story i tell is that when my mom when i was watching through that camera when she was caring for my dad i heard her scream at him mm -hmm. and i call it the scream because it wasn't the scream of just anger it was also frustration and it was also of asking for help and I said we got to put something in because people like my mom she's screaming at him but she's screaming for many other things at the same time so yes we we must be very uh, aware of that you're you're the experts in your loved one and so you tuned into that change in her behavior and then it's time for a pivot and, and figure things out. You mentioned that there's some practical things in the book. What are a few of the practical bite-sized nuggets that we can implement to and try on to be more selfless? You know, one of the things that, <clears throat> and it's very, I'll start with something <clears throat> simple. And that is um, Stanford did a study that took pairs of people that did not like each other. Mm. they were, uh, let's say it's you and me. You didn't like a Asian people. I don't like, I'll assume you're- Southern bells <clears throat> with a northern accent. All right, so I, I don't like white people. Let's just say okay. that was that okay. was a dynamic. And what they did is they paired up people like that. And then they had, and they did hundreds of pairings. And they measured their uh, chem the chemical, their happy chemicals and stress chemicals. I'm gonna get a quick bit of water. <clears throat> you can see my very high tech. You got like green process. tea, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a takeout piece of plastic. I, whatever works. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Coffee in the morning, not good for me. <clears throat> but um, what, what happened is when they measured the cortisol, which is a stress hormone, it was high. Uh, the dopamine, the, the happy stuff was low. And then they had a questionnaire that you would answer. So all things said, you and I don't like each other. Then after three meetings of about an hour on separate days, whether it's a lunch or, you know, going out or just spending time together, that measurements that were way high were almost just above zero. 
after the three meetings. Mm. And I said, you didn't need to do a study like that because you're trying to prove a point that when we reach outside of ourselves to folks that we may not think we like, that's a huge reach. Mm -hmm. And so when you're at work, think of the three folks you don't think you'd ever get along with then ask them to go have a lunch or hang out or invite them to something. And at the end of the day, you'll probably get along a okay. And you and I, Elizabeth, at the end of those three, we already get along great, but I'm just saying that theoretical, it works. And so- I would say even if you don't get along, I feel like people are just tribal by nature. Yeah. And and so what if you just shake it up a little bit? Yeah. and put some more spice in in your life. It'd be boring yeah. if we were all the same, by the way. Uh, maybe that's why we love journalism so much. Is like that's right. It's fun to meet different people and and yeah. find out what they're all about. But and, and yeah. that's why that's why we call the chapter three lunches. We dig into those things that you can do that are similar to that. That's so fun. I love to go out to lunch. That's what I miss most about my corporate job. Now that I'm a full time entrepreneur. Right. I'm like, I need to go to lunch. Um, right. Another it, one really quickly yes. is every 15 minutes we make a conscious choice. That's what the scientists say. Um, I'm not I'm not the expert on what is a conscious choice. But every 15 minutes is an opportunity for us to think about that choice not being about ourselves. Hmm. Um, I oh, it's 12 o'clock time to get lunch. Hey, Elizabeth. Can I get you something too? Nice. And the, the, the whole approach to it, and there, there are bigger things. There's a study that shows, um, which we talk about in here too, that we dug into. If you're a selfless leader at work, your team is 50% more efficient. And what is a selfless leader? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, that was a great idea. I wouldn't have thought about it otherwise. And you've changed the way we now develop that product and the way we market that product. Um, let's work on how we solve this problem. Let's bring over marketing and engineering. Yeah. We don't have all the smarts. We don't have all the smarts. Um, and some diversity within those groups. I think diversity of thought, you know, comes yeah. with diversity. Oh, Elizabeth, you're having, tr you're, you're now having trouble on timing because you've just, uh, had a child. Um, let's see how we can help you do that as a team. Those sorts of things result in 50% more efficiency. At the front, it doesn't look like it. So there's, I mean, there are different ways that we can at work and at home do these things. But it's really a mindset because once we start to do these little things, because then the criticism might be, well, these are little things. Of course we can do it, but we don't do it. Right. <clears throat> we don't do it. And the reality is once we start doing big and small things, we develop a muscle set. We talked about health earlier. The only way I'm going to get healthier is if I start doing a little bit of exercise every day. The only way we're going to get healthier as selfless people is to develop our selfless muscles and muscle tone. And those little things add up into a the bigger thing. Because then when it comes time to do the big thing, you're ready to leap. And like a, an, an analogy to that are the amazing healthcare workers and caregivers in the last two years. I would interview them, my colleagues would interview them. They have their camera up and they're, they're in their car. Remember these interviews? I'm in my car, we don't, we don't have enough equipment. Um, we're not sure what this affliction is. And then they'd put down the phone and they'd go into work. And I'm like, you just told us how horrible it was and you're now and you know what it Wait, was without armor you're going in yeah it's crazy it's, that selflessness which i was asking about to myself was because you know what every single day and all throughout their education there's some the hippocratic oath was real to them yeah. like they would serve and help all who would walk in to their facilities that's the obligation that they they swear to when they graduate and then they do every day when you and I go in and when my, when my dad would go in. And so when COVID came around, they were ready. They were 
their tone. muscles were strong. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> and I, I would, I sitting where I wrote the book, but I would go out on my little patio here on the left every night at seven o'clock and bang that pot pan lid and, and the fence as loud as I could because they represented those strong muscled selfless folks that would do stuff every day and and i i wanted to go through all of that elizabeth because i know you know I, why am i focusing on those bits the smaller bits because it does lead to a bigger bit yeah well and and one of my favorite things you know i tell my kids if they're in college now is kindness is free like whenever they would you know <clears throat> kindness is free and, and it doesn't cost anything and it's mm -hmm. it's easy to do and, and and it doesn't have to be all or nothing you just little by little just sprinkle it around what kindness like confetti i love that image because it doesn't sound like it's um yeah. too much work but and it comes back to you in bigger ways i think you and i should have you should have written a chapter in this book oh um, whatever because yes. you're, you're right it is those little things every day um but we go through it like that because often we can't even do the little ones mm -hmm. and because we also believe that it's all or nothing and the point of the book is it's not all or nothing and you you don't you're not born being this idea of desmond tutu or mother Teresa. right you're not born like that and in fact they're really not perfect there are many stories about how mother Teresa was not but we focus on the ideal the perfect and yeah it's a spectrum of, <clears throat> and there's we can always be better speaking of kindness Richard you are donating some of the net proceeds from your book where yeah. what are they going toward uh all of all of the author proceeds go to um <clears throat> a um AARP as well as the Alzheimer's Association and the Asian American Journalists Association. Uh, all are 501c3s. They all have no political view. I, I just wanted to give back to those people, those organizations that have been by my side over the last six, seven years. That's great. I love that. Um, so I have to confess, I have not read the book yet, but I did watch your documentary um, and congrats on getting a recent Iowa Independent Film Festival Award for your Sky Blossom Diaries of the Next Greatest Generation. So I watched it on Prime just for a few little dollars. Um, and Thank you. I know that your audience, that my audience would be interested in hearing about this amazing project. Uh, how did this come about and what, what <clears throat> hear a little bit about sky blossoms yeah sky blossom um is about young caregivers aged 11 to 26 and they hail from the midwest the south the east and the west and the pacific islands um their backgrounds there's five families in the in the documentary we fought it's a about a five-year project wow <clears throat> and we have a white family, a Latino family, a black family, Asian family, and a Native American family. I, I, now, I noticed that, by the way. Kudos to you. And you know why I did it, because you're an expert in this space. I did it because, yeah, we need to appreciate difference to find sameness. And when you look at all these young caregivers, it, what you see is not that. And they all happen to be in, in military families. Yeah, they're that, but they also happen to be just caregivers. <clears throat> and my voice is just, can we take a two second break? Yes. All right, I'm just gonna get some uh, warm water. That'll solve it. I know what it is. I'll be right okay. back, it happens to me all the time. Be no right problem. Back. like that perfect thing for a, a podcast is for the voice to get all groggy like that that's all right we just keep it real here i um so we were talking about sky blossoms and yeah. uh the five families you you did partner with somebody to on this documentary was it the elizabeth dole foundation yeah so the elizabeth dole foundation um they opened my eyes to caregivers and military families 
uh, about six years ago, uh, five years ago, uh, we launched and based the, the Elizabeth Dole, uh, the, the retired senator, um, it realized when she was at Walter Reed taking care of her, her, her husband, Bob, Senator Bob mm -hmm. Dole, um, that there were all these other, you know, caregivers, but they happen to be 20 and 30 something. And she said, I'm in my 70s, taking 80s, taking care of my husband, but there's this other generation. I got to get them some attention and help. So began the Hidden Heroes campaign. And when she launched it, um, me and uh, a very unknown guy called Tom Hanks and Tom <laughs> Brokaw uh, were launching it there too. I felt a little like, why am I here? Uh, but it was great to see this support of something that was so important. So that led me as I wanted to do something big uh, around the gap in culture of understanding that there were so many caregivers in America. The fact that we have 5 million children that are family caregivers. That blew my mind. Yes. We don't even know it, right? The, and so that's why in the movie we focus on aged 11 to 26 caregivers and they are and i think you'll agree with me after you saw the the documentary they are just inspiring oh trust and, me i my eyes leak probably on a daily basis anyway but um <laughs> i i love that i i do you still keep in contact with them i do and you know it really, the reason why it's called, by the way, Sky Blossom Diaries of the Next Generation, Sky Blossom is a military term that was when we first started using planes in war, the paratroopers would come in in a plane and be dropped behind the front line to help. And so the troops on the ground would look up and see these parachutes opening and they go, here come the Sky Blossoms because the, they're in the sky and these blossoms. And these young caregivers, I believe are sky blossoms. They are behind front lines. They are coming in to help. They are the cavalry and they, they're blossoming in life. Um, mm. they're, they're young and what, what, and, and because they're such amazing people that we don't see that they are the next greatest generation. I do believe this group of young caregivers are the next greatest generation. They're building aptitude and EQ and IQ that will serve them and, and us and our society for the rest of their lives. And we need to highlight them. We need to see them. Um, one of the mothers, um, Jessica Allen, was telling me about Darren, who's in the, the movie. When she saw the movie, she was like, Richard, my kid is so cool. I said, yes, <laughs> she's cool. Uh, but you know, when you're a parent and you're in it, I should, it's not about parents. It's when you're in it, you don't see it. No. And so they are the next greatest generation. And it, it, we need to look behind the head of, of folks that happen to be that age because we immediately assume, ah, oh, they're good for nothing, they're selfish. No, 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 no. You know, well, you got it when you were their age and I got it when I, I was their age. And now you see these caregivers. Well, you don't, I mean, as a, as a expert in caregiving, you, you, can, you know when you're talking to a caregiver. Oh, caregivers are, are my people for sure. But I, I hope people check it out because it's a very compelling, powerful documentary yeah. that really spotlights what is happening with our youth caregivers. Uh, and, and I just thank you for kind of putting the spotlight on that to, you, to give it some attention. You bet. It's, it's a family movie. I mean, the, the, the parents that have had their children with them watching it have always said, I've never had my kid actually talk about this stuff or stuff like this for at this level and for this long and we didn't think that we wanted to be a family movie and so we heard that started to hear that we were really grateful because it was that shared experience of caring for each other and and and, and being able to talk about that because there's going to be a point where our children will care for us and yes. and at, they're already doing it in the film as you see uh, it was also a not-for-profit film uh, in that we raised everything and for me and uh, a whole bunch of other producers over 150 people involved in it and um, the majority like over 125 were not paid for this film e even though it was a three million dollar film wow and it is because 
we were committed to getting it done. And, and thanks to my, my employers that we were able to get it out there and that you have it on Amazon. So, yes. um, and that you saw it. So thank you. Check it out. We'll link to it in the show notes. So before we hit the lightning round, I do have one question. I was like, should I ask him this? Sure. But I'm going for it. <laughs> um, so even though I once wanted to do journalism, I have to confess that I barely watch the news anymore. I just find that I had to, and particularly in my caregiving season, I had to detach myself from that because it's just like there was enough, I don't know, bombs and grenades and yeah and craziness in my own world. But how do you how do you protect your mental health and, and how do you strike that balance? Yeah. As a journalist and as a caregiver, I guess I'll answer in both of those spaces. Um, you know, when I'm not at work, uh, I will in, I used to engage in news 24 hours a day. Uh, I don't do that anymore. Uh, in caregiving, I used to engage 24 hours a day. I don't do that anymore. And um, I, I, I make sure, which I do write about in the book as well, that I'm cultivating all the loves in my life. Mm -hmm. If I love uh, to, to work in the homeless space, I should do that. If I love my work, I should do that. If, if I love thinking about you know, the Asian American Pacific Islander community, I should do that. Mm -hmm. If, you know, you, if you if you have a loved one, you should definitely do that. So it, it is pursuing. So these movies, the, the book, um, the next movie and the next book, these are all passions of mine. And so I think the way I maintain mental health is to do those. Second thing is to really think about the question. Uh, how are you? Uh, or the question you're asking, Elizabeth, which essentially is, how are you? For my mental health, it has been to stop and really take stock of how am I, number one. And number two, and I know it's different for me since I'm uh, a person that talks in, in, in the public space, is even though wherever I'm at, if I believe you are listening, and I know you're listening, Elizabeth, is that I will sit and stop. I'll... I won't feel like I need to immediately answer. And I'll think for, I'll put, I'll look down like this for about two seconds and then I'll answer. And I'll try to answer as real and as raw that I believe you're ready to accept as opposed to the, I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm good. I try not to answer with that unless I believe the person that's asking me is not ready. For those who are ready, Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you now how I really feel and how I'm doing. Um, and so and that Mine is not a feeling. It's not a feeling, people. It's just a yeah. word. Yeah. And, and so really, so two, two sides of that question. When you ask, do the best of your ability to really ask, how are you? And when you answer, really answer, you know, I just came back from visiting my mother on Thursday and man was I tired and mm -hmm. a lot of my co-workers said Richard you look like a wreck um that's honesty um and it's good for me to say it out loud because a lot of things when we hear ourselves say it thoughtful things that we hear ourselves say it, it really has been very educational for me to hear that out loud so I, I do say that talking about caregiving so much has been part of my therapy and it really has been. It's been part of my journey too, for sure. Yeah. Writing, and talking yeah. about it. it's cathartic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that I was hoping for folks to be able to be more intentional about their self care is, uh, I wrote a journal called the Just for You: A Daily Self Care Journal. I wrote it with caregivers in mind because I have found that a lot of caregivers lose themselves in this process, and so it allows them the space. Um, and I use daily on a, on a, you know, I don't have it filled out every day. I pick it up and put it down and it could be a five year journal if you'd like it to be. Uh, but I, the, the point is just to be mindful about your self care. So I have a couple of questions I'm going to ask you. Um, first of all, do you have a favorite quote? Mm. The one that's been driving me, I said at the beginning is joy despite difficulty. Mm. 
I love that. It, it drove the movie and the book and, and, the, and the soul of what we did in both. Yes, yes. What object in your home brings you comfort? Mm. Mm. My couch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, I, there, you know, there, there is some uh, self-care for sure in, in Netflix and Prime and all the other ones. How do you unwind before bedtime? Um, I will watch something I'll, and I'll watch something random. I'll, I'll just pull up YouTube and see what it's going to tell me. And I'll, and then I just, otherwise everything is so planned for me. It's like, I'm going to, I have to do this and do that. And just to, cause I don't often just, you know, I know many folks do that, but I don't do that very often. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fun, fun little thing for you. I love it. Um, Let's see. We talked about that one already. Let me switch to this one. That's a big book. Yeah. What did you, well? There's 365 prompts, and there's some fun things in the in the months in between. What did your teenage self imagine you'd be doing right now? <laughs> uh, teenage self wasn't sure what was going to happen because teenage self hated school. Ran out. Uh, flunked um, almost flunked twice got kicked out of one high school what? Teena teenage self was yeah teenage self shocking worked at in fast food for five years and didn't go to college um i think teenage self just knew that um i was not thinking i had to do anything that was you're supposed to do wow you've come a long way richard I don't know about that. <laughs> I think so. I think that's another book for sure. Um, okay, last question is, is your favorite daily ritual? Mm. Well, what, what caused the frog in my voice today is a coffee. But what happens, uh, some people are, and this is the coffee that's left. Um, what happens to someone when they have coffee is it, it affects your, and you've heard of this if you're a singer, uh, I'm not, but it affects your vocal cords. Mm. And so if you ever have trouble, like, why am I groggy? So some days I'll have a cup of coffee. This is what happens. So my daily ritual is having a cup of coffee. I love it. I, That's not that, fun, but I like it. No, I mean, it's I, get, I got gifted by my daughter a Nespresso machine with a frother, and it is like an event Ooh, in my morning. Yeah. Um, yes. yes, I recommend that. It's, it's Are you a two cupper or a three cupper? I'm a just I'm a, a double espresso. Just get it all, get it all in one punch. I'm an efficient <laughs> coffee drinker. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, less space, more power. Yeah, and then I'm power. trying to do a green tea in the afternoon. That's kind of my one of the things I'm trying to get implement back again. You know, try so this way. I also I'll put a green tea and a ginger tea bag in the same thing. Ooh. So you're kind of, you know, they'd have mixes, but if you put the two bags, you know, sometimes some of the green teas can be a little weak. Some of the ginger teas can be a little weak, put them both in and it stews nicely. I will try that. I like to try new things. That's so we'll, we'll get that in. How do people connect with you, Richard, and, and learn more about this, these projects and the future projects you have going on? You know, um, all those social platforms um, are a great way. And for instance, like we're, we're doing a, a push for National Family Caregivers Month around the book because it was inspired by caregiving. And as, as you know, a lot of the stories that I tell are about family caregiving. Um, and so all the social channels will will reflect uh, anything that's new and that, that happens. There's also richardlouis.com, which as this is what I've struggled with so much because the book's enough about me and it, you, have the, the, you, are, you get what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, it's it's why we did not put a picture of me on on the cover. It was uh, some folks on the team want. It's like no, no, no. We're not. We're not. Not. It's not going to be even funny. Don't do it. <laughs> well, I think it's you know you have a name like you said. You're a public figure, and what I appreciate about that is that you're giving. Um, you're advocating for all the things that are important to me and that I care about. So I appreciate that. You know, I think having those big voices helps make change. So thank you for everything that you're doing in the caregiving landscape. Oh, you betcha. And thank you for having the podcast and focusing on happy, healthy 
caregivers. It's fantastic. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Take care, Richard. Thanks, Elizabeth.